started on the invention of Hugo Cabret, which is such an extraordinary book. Tell me where that came from. So that came from 15 years of other books <laughs> that I had been making. Right. It was... It was, right, these things never come out, out of nowhere. They're yeah. always a long, hard slog. Yeah, I did have one idea. That's all you need. You it just turns need out, one idea. It turns out you only need one idea. Right. And I had had this one idea about, God, a good 10 or 15 years earlier. Okay. And it was about a kid who meets George Maliez, the, the French filmmaker, because I had seen A Trip to the Moon where the rocket goes into the eye of the moon. And I just thought, there's... A story in that yeah. a kid who you know my first book was about a boy who meets the magician Harry Houdini and I thought maybe there's a story in a boy meeting George Maliez but I didn't have you know a plot or you know a character right. or or anything I just had that little seed and it sat in the back of my head and as often happens to so many of us and I'm sure to everybody in some fashion mm when you have something on your mind, it will often feel like the world is saying, here's a little help, here's a little something, here's a little reminder, it's something, right. things will start coming in. Right. So pretty soon after this reemerged, I was reading the newspaper one morning, and there was a book review in the New York Times mm -hmm. about a new book uh, about the history of automatons. Okay. And there was a, ch uh, it mentioned that there was a chapter about the filmmaker George Melies, uh -huh. and that he had a collection in real life of automatons, these very complicated wind-up machines. Brilliant. And at the end of his life, he donated them. He donated them to a museum, mm -hmm. and they were put up in their attic. They were never put on display, and the attic apparently leaked, and they were all destroyed oh. and thrown away. Oh, and I, you're right. And I, I'm reading that, and all of a sudden, I saw. I didn't think it. I didn't imagine it I saw it a boy was on the pile of broken automatons rescuing one mm -hmm. and that felt like a gift like it felt so like that one image yeah. is it was yeah. the kind yeah. of it would have been super helpful if I got more than that it really helpful but, but I mean, that's not what I, I was that's all I was given right but that was clearly the beginning yeah. of a story right and it, you know, so then I began asking myself questions. Who is this boy? What is he doing with these machines? Is he going to fix one of them? If he's going to fix it, why does he think he can fix it? Because a kid, grown-ups can't fix these things. They're right. so complicated. So I spent the next three years answering all of those questions. And those answers became the book. So you had the first idea for Hugo. Then what happened? So then it, I don't start by... I knew I wanted to have it illustrated in some fashion, okay. but I didn't know how I wanted to illustrate it. I didn't want to do a graphic novel where there were word bubbles, uh -huh. so anything that was dialogue would remain in text. In the text. Anything that was a thought would remain in text. Uh -huh. Anything that was a smell would remain in text. Um, but everything, everything that I could, I yeah. would pull out and replace with images. Right. So I had a three-page written description of the train station. And I remember I had a metaphor where I was comparing the ribs of the train station to the ribs of a, a dinosaur skeleton. Uh -huh. And the birds trapped in the train station were, you know, sort of parallel with Melies and the little boy trapped. And so I took all of that out. And I love I, it. You're like, I'll just draw it. Gone, yeah, I'll just draw just it. Just draw it. When you put it like that, it makes it sound so logical. Like, right. why don't why don't we all do that? Yeah, like, if you why can, don't all books do that? If you can. It makes it sound so sensible. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, in order to tell the same amount of information in yeah. pictures with words, yeah. uh, it grew. And so it, I, in the text, I said, you know, we're in Paris, you know, that, but how do you know you're in Paris? Well, what's always helpful is the Eiffel Tower, mm -hmm. if your story takes place after the Eiffel Tower was built. <laughs> right. And so I thought, okay, I'll start with the moon. And then you turn the page and you see the moon over a city and then you turn the page and you we sort of like become closer and we can see the eiffel tower so we know we're in paris and then uh we need to see a train station so then i zoom in on a train station mm -hmm. and then i had described how this boy goes into the train station and runs through it and then i would go in and by the time i had finished replacing the three pages of text with pictures that told the same amount it was 30 pictures, yeah. which is 60 pages, <laughs> because every single one of my drawings is yeah. a full double page spread. Right. 
And so you're so, like, huh, not a novella anymore. Apparently. So by the time I, and plus sometimes I had Hugo ran through the station. Yeah. And you can show one picture of a boy like this. Right. But that's not, not actually the running through the station. Yeah. yeah. So, so sometimes one sentence would become 10 pages. Right. And so by the time I had gone through, it, 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 it had leapt from the 95 page novella to the almost 600 page and looking back on looking back on Hugo now, was it a slog to write? Was it a joy to write? I mean, I'm sure it was a bit of both, as all books are. But like, what are your what's your memory of of the experience of writing Hugo now? I I have a weird backwards way of working where I start with plot elements, uh -huh. and then those come into place, and then they come into place with characters who I begin to form okay. to make that plot happen. And then the last thing that comes into focus is the emotional reason that everything is happening, that drives the character to make the plot. So it's this weird, it's just backwards. Okay. And so for most of the time, it's like, it's exciting to, you know, put the plot together and to realize, oh, if he goes over here, this can happen. And plus I had the real life of George Melies to hang a lot of the plot on. Right. And so, so a lot of, almost everything in Hugo that happens to George Melies actually happened to the real person okay uh what i was doing was was weaving in this fictional boy yeah. to become the cause of all of those things right so that the boy ends up saving the old man in a way that the old man also ends up saving the boy and so most of the time like it feels a little bit like i'm i'm kind of like wandering through the darkness okay and then I like stumble upon something and that feels right. Okay. And then I stumble upon something else. Right. And then eventually you realize, oh, I, and you're putting it together. And then finally at the end you go, oh my gosh, I made a table. Right. Like, and so to me, that sounds like a difficult, painful slog, but maybe it's a wonderful, magical, creative few months and years of joy. Uh, no, no, no it, the first one the is first more, one. it's, it's not like slog isn't the right word because I'm getting to do what I want to do, right? Like, I'm getting to tell a story. Yeah, like, you're like, still allowed to complain about right. it. I mean, <laughs> yes, and that's I, human I, nature. Right, and, Come my, on. and my husband will, you know, <laughs> confirm that I do right. uh, a lot of complaining. Terrific. Because it is hard, and yeah. it is painful, and it is uh, scary sometimes to think that you've come this far, but what happens if you don't finish it? What happens if you don't figure out the... the the rest of right. what's going to happen. Or what, what if it turns out to be a rubbish idea yeah. or, you know. Yeah, all of those things yeah. are constantly you coming you're, up. You're worrying if the magic is going to be there and you don't really know until you finish. Yeah, and and so it's, it, I, I do tend to feel a little bit terrified as I'm working. So when the moments happen where you do figure something out, yeah. where you realize like, oh, that's the reason this is all happening or this is what this moment is about, that is a real moment of joy. Like it is thrilling. Right. But I think it's very healthy to feel terrified quite a lot of the time yeah, in I, one's work, yeah, in one's I, creativity. Yeah. I am currently trying to see what it's like to feel slightly less terrified uh, all the time, because <laughs> that doesn't seem bad either. Like, it seems possible sure. to do the work and maybe be slightly less terrified. Sure. Uh, but I do, I have tended to move through my work like that. So it was three years of, well, I will say this, I knew it was a good idea. I did know that. I knew it was a good idea. Interesting. I, I also didn't know if I could do it. Right, but you knew it was a good idea. I knew it was a good idea. And, and there, was a, uh, there was a point where I almost uh, uh, hired a friend of mine who's a really good illustrator to illustrate it because uh -huh. I didn't think I was up to the task. Okay. And so, which, I, which now in retrospect, I think is actually a good thing, like, like in terms of like aiming higher and, do, and right. pushing yourself yeah. to, to really do something you think you might not be able to do. Right. Like I, it, I really had to push myself. Yeah. And because I had like I had never made a book like this, I had never seen a book like this. Like like I didn't I didn't know if kids would get it. Yeah, it's about French silent movies, which is not <laughs> something children are interested in. Like there was no reason anybody should have liked this book, right? Except I did, <laughs> and so I and my editor uh, Tracy Mack at Scholastic was completely supportive the entire time. She loved the idea. Also, she kept encouraging me to cut more text out and replace it with more pictures, make it right. bigger, make it longer. Uh, whatever would work for the story. Yeah. And, and it's all you can do with any creative endeavor is make stuff that you like yeah. and think is good and hope the rest of the world does. Because if you try to second guess the rest of the world, yeah. then you're in trouble. You just got to make stuff that you think is cool and like yeah. hope everyone agrees. Right? Yeah. And when I, well, well, <laughs> when I finished, yeah. I 
knew I was done. Yeah. When I felt like I had made the thing I had been intending to make the whole time without knowing it. But does one ever get to that point? Did you really be like, I've done it. Yeah. I have done it. Yeah. Really? Uh -huh. Wow. Yeah. No, I finished. Like I actually wow. finished. Wow. And it was, it was everything I couldn't have known it was going to be when I began it. Uh-huh. But it was what it was. It, it's what it was supposed to be. I didn't know if it was good. Sure. I didn't know if anybody would like it, but that's, that that's didn't different. matter. Yeah. I didn't know if, if, I didn't know if, I didn't, it was what it, all I knew was it was what it was supposed to be. And that's the only bit you can control. Yeah. You can't control what other people think of it or when it's out in yeah. a big wide world. The only bit you can control in a creative sense is that it was, it turned out how you wanted it to turn out. You've done your bit. Yeah. Yeah. Like I did, I did my work and it, and I felt satisfied with what it was. That's all you can do. And I remember very, very consciously thinking when I was done, yeah. this, and I, this is good. So Dorothy Parker said, I don't like writing. I like having written. Yes. And, 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 and I, I live by yeah. that. I think that is so true. Yeah. I like the bit before writing and I like the bit after writing. Yeah. But actually writing is kind of horrifying. If you ask me what I, like how things are going when I'm working on it. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's hope, there's moments that are, like we were talking about, there's moments that are positive, there's moments of joy. But I, I, I could never really say uh, in, like, you can't say anything definitely because you don't know what it's going to be. Right. But when, I, when I'm done and I have made the thing that I meant to make, even yeah. though I didn't know that's what I was meant to make. Right. Then I can say, well, I'm done when I can say it's good. And I and Hugo was good when I was done, but I didn't know if any. Again, I didn't know if anybody else would think that. That's I out of that. your control. I thought that. Yeah. And so, I remember thinking, even if no one else likes this, even if no one reads it, I will take everything I learned because I learned so much and right. just make another book. And it turned out people liked it. Tell me what you love about Walt Whitman's writing. It's, it, what's interesting is it feels like he's writing now about us, uh, not, and not even about us, about me, you know, and not even me, like if you pick it up, you feel like you're, he's writing about you, okay. like everyone feels like he's writing about the, the, the them. Right, like he knows them. Yeah, and, and, and because he's unafraid, because he's willing to be honest about the things that are hard, mm -hmm. the things that are painful, mm -hmm. and also about America too, like the, the, uh -huh. the ugly side, the dark side of America. Yeah. Um, he does that with us as well, with, with the things that are um, inside of us. And right. whether you're queer, whether you're straight, whatever you are, trans, whatever you are, right. there's something in how he talks about the body and the soul right. that feels modern and present and completely alive right and plus he constantly talks about how, how you're holding him in your hands and you're touching him uh -huh. and if you have him in your pocket you you he's you know on your skin he's by your thigh i'm so interested in that idea of the sort of the, the tactile connection to a book yeah and, and you know like why aren't more books made of sort of velvet yeah. because it's such <laughs> a it's such a tactile relationship yeah. and it is like the books you love one does feel this need to kind of clutch them like this in yeah. a very physical way yeah. i'm very interested in that idea yeah and i will say that one of the beautiful things about the persephone books is like as, as a as you know when you sort of squint everything looks the same and i you know had mentioned right. that as a joke yeah. earlier but every single one of them feels so beautiful the, right. the, the, the 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 it's a it's a very i think it's like a matte What's, the, what's this kind of finish called? I call it wipe clean. <laughs> Which it does. If you spill your tea on it, it, it no clean. problem at all. Wipes wipe clean. clean. We're very practical here. Oh my something. god, but super yeah. practical, <laughs> and it feels really good, doesn't it? Yeah. And so that sort of tactile quality and that idea yeah. that the body itself uh, is reflected in the book. I that love the, that. That the book is a body. Yeah. And it can, you know, like us, our body contains our soul. The the book itself contains. Everything. See, you know? fascinating. Yeah. Physically contains yeah. everything. Fascinating. So, you know, so here's all of humanity, except yeah. everyone you pick up, yeah. you open it and they're different inside. Yeah, but it's a different aspect of humanity. Yeah, yeah. I love that. And that's and that's really beautiful to me. So so Whitman is reflected in that. Tell me the best part of being a professional writer and then the worst part of being a professional <laughs> writer. No, I mean I I really love what I do. Like I, I love the fact that I get to 
write these, make up these stories, tell them with words and pictures. And, and on, I really think the best part is meeting people who have read my books and, right. who, and for whom it feels like I wrote my book specifically for them. You know, when people, because I, you know, we all have books like that. Yeah. You know, and when I, when I, when I read The Secret Garden or there's, there's, there's books that I read, it's like, oh, this, this is mine. Yeah. Like when I read The Amazing mm -hmm. Ca Ca Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. Oh, I love Cavalier and Clay. I was like, Clay. it was so nice yeah. of Michael Chabon to write this book for me. <laughs> like, like I, that's so sweet. Like, I, it's fine. Other people are reading it. Right. But it's mine. I love how to think about it that way. That's so yeah. interesting. And so when people say that to me, like, there's nothing, like, I know what that means to me with other writers. Yeah. So when someone says it to me, I take it really seriously. Right. And I always say I did. I, I did. Oh. I wrote it for you and for nobody else. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I no, but I did. Right. I literally did. When I'm having that conversation yeah. and you're telling me that this book felt like that for right. you, that's why I wrote it. That is cool. It's a, it, cause ultimately it's about that connection. Yeah. Right. You know, like, and, and yeah, it, we, we talk about how hard it is and the difficulty and the fear and the terror, but ultimately when the story comes together in that moment that I was describing when I do feel like something is good. Yeah. Um, you know, it's such a, it's such a thrill to be able to hand it over right. and to have that reaction. Okay, what's the worst part of being a professional writer? I'll start. It's really boring and lonely. Now your turn. <laughs> it is. That is something I cannot dispute. Okay. I can't... I mean, you're welcome to. I can't but. argue <laughs> with the fact that a lot of times I get up in the morning and there's a full day ahead of me. And I, rec and I recognize saying this is a luxury. But there are times when I literally don't know what I'm going to do because I don't know how to solve the problems I have. Right. There's always problems to solve. I always, I, I'm always working. Like I'm always in the middle of a book or something. But that's because you love your work. Yeah. So work in a way is a, is a misnomer. Yeah. But it's something that you love to do. Yes. Yeah. So. And, and, I'm, and I'm grateful for the fact that I get to do it. I, I spent many years with people not reading any of my books. Right. And so but it's... you're still allowed to hate some aspect of it. What is it? Come on. <laughs> Tell me, what is it? <laughs> it? I mean, it's it is that that terror of feeling like I'm never gonna solve it. Like like right. like that that is something that hasn't gone away, mm -hmm. and and the 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 inability to to feel secure. Like like. But in a way, that's you know not to be grandiose about it, but that's kind of what it means to be human. Because if you solved it you'd be done and then what would be the point of writing more books and creating more and endeavoring to do more you'd be like oh i solved it yeah so i'll just sit around and drink pina colada <laughs> yeah. you know to be human is to keep on going and keep on trying and yeah. feel like there's more out there that you want to do so you recently illustrated the harry potter books what yeah. was that like it well that was uh, a phone call that i was not expecting to get <laughs> i got it on halloween and I was a really big Harry Potter fan. You were. I came to them late. I didn't read them until about three years before I got the phone call. But when I read them, right. I fell in as deeply as people do. Amazing. Weeping and so caught up. But then so much pressure to... So the pressure was really overwhelming. When, yeah. when, the, when they asked me on the phone if I would do new covers for the 20th anniversary editions... Did you cry? Oh, no. In my head, I screamed super loudly the <laughs> word no. Like, no! I didn't say that out loud. Right. Luckily. But my first thought was, no! Like, who could do that? Right. Like, don't do that. <laughs> like, we all own Harry Potter. We all love Harry Potter. That is a terrible idea, you guys. <laughs> I mean, goodbye. Luckily, the... F Front part of my brain, like, <laughs> kept that part of my brain quiet right. so I could just keep listening. Because also, it, it would be rude to just scream no at people asking you to do the sure. 20th anniversary covers. Sure. I figured, let them finish their, you know, statement. Their, and then their, say no. And then maybe <laughs> scream no. But no, it was, it was about the pressure and it was about trying, yeah, like, what does it mean to live up to the, the love that I felt for those stories, the love that the world feels for those stories? Yeah. And so what was the process of coming up with the illustrations? So by the time they had finished offering me the job <laughs> yeah. and describing what it would on the be, phone. The, yeah, yeah, on the phone, by the time they had finished that 
uh, by the time they finished asking me, yeah. I had come up with the entire idea. So I went from screaming no <laughs> to listening yeah. to thinking, as they were talking, thinking, I have to do seven covers mm -hmm. and a box. Mm -hmm. And they needed a sketch. So I'm listening. So I'm like, my mind's working and I'm, and, and I'm listening. They need a sketch in two weeks yeah. and for everything and the finished art in about two months. And so technically I'm also thinking like, that's not possible, <laughs> but I, I quickly saw that I could do all seven, that I, I, if I did all seven covers as a single image yeah. that from first to last tells the entire story of Harry Potter. Sure. Easy. Easy. Yeah. If I did it in black and white, yeah. which is how I'm most comfortable and how I most loved working, I, 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 I could possibly do this. So by the end of that conversation, you had, you had it all set. Yeah. I mean, who wasn't? Yeah. Sure. I mean, yeah, I've done it. I figured it out. It's fine. Next. So, yeah. so at the end of the conversation, I said to them, I can't say yes right now. I have to think about it. Plus I was working on three or four other very, very big projects. Right. So there's also a real time consideration. I'm kind of a bit busy, JK. <laughs> I'm just like a bit busy and I don't know. I'm sorry. What are you about? <laughs> you know how it is. Sure. There's stuff. I mean, no, I like, don't know how it is. But yes, yeah, I'm going to agree with you. We all have stuff going on. Sure. Right? Yeah. Whatever comes along, we all have our life that we're in the middle of. Of course. And so I did say to them at the end of the conversation, I, 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 I have to look at my schedule and actually figure everything out. Right. But if I were to do all seven covers as a single image, yeah. if I were to do it in black and white, uh, which I don't think had been done for Harry Potter covers and was a little bit of, you know, an unusual thing to ask. Sure. Um, you know, do you think you would be interested in that? Do you think if, when you pass that idea along to yeah. uh, J.K. Rowling and her people, do you think they might be interested? And right away, Scholastic was like, oh, that's interesting. And so I, I hung up the phone. I didn't know, I didn't know if I'd be able to do it. I didn't know if I'd be able to finish in time. Because also, not only the other jobs, but... Can you actually finish in time? Can right. you actually get the sketches out? Can you actually do all seven images in time? You know, you don't want to say yes and then not be able to deliver it. Right. And so I sat down and I immediately drew a sketch. I had it to. I had a a, a, a rough sketch to them. I had two weeks. I got it to them in a one week, and that got approved. Right. And I did it. So tell me about the reception of the Harry Potter covers. So it was so amazing to have those go out into the world because nerve wracking though. It, was, it, it means so much to so many people. It was nerve wracking, but it it, it, it we all love the books equally. Right. I lo I'm a fan, and so being able to give my book, to share my 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 image with everybody, right. was so incredibly exciting, and and it felt like. The, re the, the, the reception reflected that back. Every, everybody was excited to see, Amazing. you know, this particular version right. of Harry Potter. Tell me about a book that you just love, 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 that you clutch to your chest and want everyone you know to read. Mm. So for me, probably the, the, the main one is The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay by oh. Michael Chabon, which... That is a wonderful book, which, isn't it? There's just so much about it in terms of... The, the weaving in of mythology, the mm -hmm. weaving in of superheroes, the weaving in of the world's fairs, yeah. the weaving in of these, the queer elements. Like, there's so much about it that is exactly what I'm most interested in. I, right. My husband and I collect world's fair mm -hmm. ephemera. Uh, there's, there's, there's just so much in it. And, and it has such a big heart. It does. And Cavalier and Clay is one of those books that feels like it's always existed. It feels like a classic. Like yeah. ever since it first came out, it felt yeah. like it's been around for a hundred years. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and, and, uh, The Secret Garden. I, I, I The Secret Garden. Which, which I also recently reread. What do you love about The Secret Garden? I love that it's, it's really pretty dark. Like it really, <laughs> like, like we, we, we forget how. Well, all kids books are. Yeah. The, the really good ones aren't afraid of that darkness, that shadow. Right. Death. Right. Um, you know, and, and, and Mary Lennox is a properly unpleasant person yeah. in the beginning and, and the ugliness that she has been, uh, feeling and the way that she has been raised without love from her, from her parents right. and how that's reflected out in the world and the way that the garden itself, 
um, you know, blossoms in, 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 in the way that it's reflecting her journey, which now has become, you know, it, it's a cliche for so many people. It's, or they, they, they hear the title and they, they think they know what it is. Right. But if you haven't read it in a long time, like, right. go back right. because it's, it's dark and it's complicated and the characters are so compelling and it's, right. it's Francis really Hutchins beautiful. Burnett, yeah. right? We have a Francis Hutchins Burnett right here. Uh, which one? It's called The Shuttle. You <gasps> won't know it no. because we reprint books that yeah. are completely wonderful and brilliant but nobody knows about. So this is called The Shuttle and it's about American heiresses in the 19th century getting the boat over to England to marry English aristocrats. Oh and it's my God. Um, very long but really readable and sort of riveting. There you go. Fantastic. Thank you.